they've seemed to have bypassed entirely the fussless, significant criteria of the Bible to carry on their very, very spiritual religion. And this is a great tragedy indeed. In fact, Bob Brinsmead and I, in a major charismatic forum in Australia, uh, we had to, did battle, as it were, with a major charismatic leader who was standing up and saying, I'm a spirit-filled Christian and I've had this experience and I've had that experience, I've observed these miracles and I've observed that miracle. When we got home, his wife rang us and she said, I'd like, you to, I'd like you to know that our home is in absolute chaos. We're estranged, we don't communicate, he's never home, the children don't know what he looks like. That's Christian religion for you. Is it any wonder that Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, the madman of the later 19th century, said the thing about you Christians, you talk so much about redemption and yet you look so unredeemed. You see, what I'm trying to do is to suggest areas or reasons why our freedom is so often not obvious to each other and to those outside us. So this is the prerequisite number one for a mentally healthy religion. It is a religion that helps people move from a sense of guilt which is probably the most basic psychophysical problem in all human existence to a state and experience of forgiveness. And one that provides significant ethical guidelines but does not allow itself to delve into ethical trivia. <coughs> I want to mention now characteristic number two of a mentally healthy religion. Have I made myself clear in that first point? Okay, prerequisite number two for a mentally healthy religion is this. A religion that promotes mental health is one which will stimulate the growth of inner freedom and personal responsibility. A mentally healthy religion is one that will stimulate the growth of inner freedom and personal responsibility. We mentioned, did we not, that Jesus Christ in his living and his dying has overcome for us the wrath of God. He has borne in his own body on the tree the full extent of God's wrath. God has exhausted his wrath in Jesus Christ on the tree for those who believe. We mentioned that Jesus Christ delivered us out from under the curse of the law. Every single person, and this is Paul's point in Galatians there, you might remember, every person who tries to find acceptance with God on the basis of what they do or what they don't do are under a curse. And that curse works itself out in human existence. There's no question of that. And let's remember that not doing is as much doing as doing. I know plenty of people who think they are accepted with God not on the basis of what they do, but they think they're accepted with God on the basis of what they're not doing. That's just as legalistic as the former. Not doing is as much doing as doing. And whereas it's quite right for Christians to say that those who persevere to the end shall be saved, it is not right for them to turn around and say, I'm accepted with God because I'm persevering. But it's also not right for them to turn around and say, I'm accepted with God because I haven't fallen away. Legalism is in our bones. We are accepted with God from first to last on the ground of the doing and the dying of Jesus Christ, period. No qualification. And just because Jesus said, he who perseveres to the end shall be saved, that is no ground for you and for me to turn around and say, we are accepted because we persevere or we are accepted because we do not fail to persevere. That is to turn a perfectly clear and straightforward statement of our Lord into a legalistic bent. 
We saw also that Jesus Christ delivered us from the power of demonic bondage. That was in his life here on earth. But we saw also that when he ascended to the right hand of God, he dispensed the Holy Spirit. He baptised the people with the Holy Spirit so that there was subjectively wrought out in those who believe what Jesus objectively wrought out on the cross when he was on earth. So that the gospel is the freedom of the believer. Jesus took it away objectively when he was on earth and he sent the Holy Spirit to bring about the subjective release from the wrath of God and fear of the wrath of God and he, and he sent the Holy Spirit to give about the subjective release from the law and from demonic bondage. Whatever the demonic powers of the world had over us, however they held us in subjective bondage, the gift of the Spirit as the glorious fruit of the doing and dying of Jesus broke that bondage subjectively when we received the Holy Spirit. This is why the gift of the Spirit is such a glorious bounty in the church. I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8. This Romans chapter 8 is the great passage of the gift of the Spirit. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life set me free, says Paul, from the law of sin and death. This is a subjective uh, freedom that we're talking about. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by our sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. If you're interested any time to know what the law was powerless to do, you need to look up Hebrews 7.19 where it says that the law made nothing perfect. So what the law was powerless to do was to make anything perfect. But Paul says that God did this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, notice, who do not live according to our sinful nature but according to the Spirit. Christians now are those who live according to the Spirit. They are the pneumatic people. They are the ones who are spiritually governed and spiritually controlled. And what a pity it is that charismatics and Pentecostals have come along and uh, tried to make the possession of the Spirit a, a sort of a, a, a first class possession while all other Christians have to struggle along in spiritual coachcraft status or economy class. Those who live according to their sinful nature have their minds set on what the na that nature desires, says Paul. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Please note, Paul is not talking about two types of Christians here, namely those who live according to their sinful nature, because Christians don't live like that anymore. You see that in the last section of verse 4 who do not live according to our sinful nature but according to the Spirit. So there's no two grades of Christians here. Paul is saying those who live according to their sinful nature, non-Christians, have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit, namely Christians, compare verse 4, have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death but the mind controlled by the Spirit, which is the Christian mind, is life and peace. Because the sinful mind is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by their sinful nature, meaning non-Christians, cannot please God. And then to show that I haven't been reading into this, Paul says, you, you Christians, however, are controlled not by your sinful nature but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. 
And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. I want you to note this. We have an obligation, but it is not to our sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if you, live, if you by the Spirit put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The beautiful thing is that Paul is saying two things, if I understand him in this passage. First, he says, Christians are those now who possess the Spirit and who walk according to the Spirit and not according to the sinful nature. All that contrast between those who walk according to the sinful nature and those who walk according to the Spirit are, is a contrast between those who are Christians and those who are non-Christians, not two classes of Christians. I've heard these texts spoken of in holiness meetings where it's spoken of as sort of two states of Christian existence and an exhortation to 